Get um, started. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me say welcome to uh, Xunhua, who is uh, here with us from uh, Columbia in New York. Uh, she's a PhD student there with uh, Omri Weinstein and Alex Antoni, and she's going to talk to us uh, about uh, faster general LP solvers. Uh, okay. And yeah, well, let me let me leave it at that. But maybe to say also that it's worth checking out Shunhua's other papers. There's already sort of other interesting related things like a fast solver for SDPs. But thank you, Shunhua, for for speaking to us. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to this talk. I'm really honored. So today I'm going to talk about um, a recent paper about a faster algorithm for solving general LPs. And this is joint work with my advisor, Omri Weinstein, uh, and Hanji Zhang, who is also a PhD student at Columbia, and Zhao Song, who was a postdoc at IAS at Princeton. Okay, so first, uh, let me give an overview about what I'm going to talk about today. So I'll first uh, remind you what is a linear program and briefly talk about the history of algorithms for solving linear programs. And then I'll give a brief overview of our result and before I move on to the more technical part, uh, I'll provide you with a background of this central pass algorithm and how we can reduce this to a projection maintenance data structure problem. And then I will go into the details. So first I'll talk about uh, how we achieve faster update in our data structure and how we achieve faster queries. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, sorry, and Shunhua, let me just ask you, would you like sort of to take questions along the way if, say, I, I can ask people to ask in the chat and I'll tell you if there are questions, or would you prefer to leave them till the end? Yeah, sure. Um, you can just ask questions along the way. I'm happy to take them. Okay, so then people should feel free to, to post things in the chat and I'll, I'll try to pay attention so we notice. Cool, thanks. Okay, so the first part. Uh, let me remind you what is a linear program. So a linear program has a form that looks like this. We wanted to minimize some linear objective function uh, subject to some linear constraints. So here's, a, uh, illustration. here's a small example of a linear program with two variables and three constraints. And these constraints would correspond to a polytope in the 2D dimension. And this is the objective function. And the objective function would correspond to a line in the 2D dimension. And solving linear programs, basically, we wanted to find uh, the intersection of this line with the polytope. So we wanted to find this corner here. OK. Uh, and in this paper, we consider um, the general dense LP. So we consider the case where our matrix A have size D times N, and it is a dense matrix. And also, this D is the number of constraints, and N is the number of variables. We consider the case where D has the same order of N. And we consider this formulation of our LP. So just one thing to notice that here we assume that uh, all the constraints are equalities. And actually for LP, it doesn't matter if it's equality or inequality, they are all equivalent. And this is the DO formulation of this primal problem. Uh, and in our algorithms, we will use the select variables for the DO. So if you add some S variable here, so these uh, LPs are also equivalent. Okay. So now let me first talk about a brief history about uh, program about algorithms for solving linear programs. So the problem of solving a linear system of uh, inequalities dates back to the 19th century. And the first algorithm for solving LPs was the simplex algorithm. It was developed by Danzig in 1947. Uh, the simplex algorithms are very efficient in practice, and it's still used in the state-of-the-art LP solvers even today. However, it could have exponential time in the worst case in theory. So there exists an explicit construction of an example that would take exponential time, and that's called the clean minty cube. So people began to wonder, so can we have an algorithm for LP that we can prove that it has polynomial time in the worst case? And the first such algorithm was the ellipsoid algorithm. Um, it was first developed by Kachin in 1977. 
However, this algorithm was very slow in practice, so people don't use it today. So now the next question becomes, can we have an algorithm that we can both show that it's polynomial time in theory, and it also, we can use it in practice? And that's the interior point methods. It was first developed by Kamarker in 1984. So we can also prove that they have a worst case polynomial time, and they're also efficient in theory. So most of the state of the art LP solvers use uh, variants of this interior point methods. And another thing to notice is that uh, the interior point methods only have square root of n iterations, however, the, where the ellipsoid method had n iterations. So after these type of algorithms were proposed, later works mainly focused on optimizing these algorithms. And on the theoretical uh, line of research, uh, so be, until recent years, the best algorithms was given in this uh, Wadia paper in 1989. Uh, this is the fastest a theoretical algorithm for dense square matrix, and it has running time um, n to the 2.5 times log 1 over delta, where delta is the accuracy parameter. So that's the history until recent years. And recently, uh, in 2019, there was another paper that broke this n to the 2.5 barrier. This paper was by Cohen, Lee, and Stone. So let me first explain what are these exponents here. So the omega here is the exponent of matrix multiplication. So it is defined as the minimum exponent to multiply to n by n matrix. Notice that naively, if we wanted to multiply to n by n matrix, it would take n cubed time. But there exist more complicated algorithms that only take n to the 2.37 time. And the alpha here is called the du exponent of matrix multiplication. So the alpha is defined uh, as the maximum exponent, such that multiplying at n by n matrix with an n by n to the alpha matrix can be done in n squared time. So note that uh, even multiplying a matrix with a vector would take n squared time. So this alpha is non-trivial. So currently the best number of alpha is 0 0.31. And this type of multiplication is called fast rectangular matrix multiplication. Okay. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that after this initial work, there were three follow-ups that achieved the same running time, but they used different uh, fast query techniques. Okay. Um, so one thing to notice about um, these, uh, this, this running time is that it matches the current omega for the current values. So if you plug in this omega and this alpha equals 0.31 into these exponents, you may see that this exponent 2.5 minus alpha over 2 is smaller than omega. So uh, the running time can be simplified as just into the omega for the current uh, value of omega. And this is quite remarkable because this is an algorithm for general dense uh, LP. And even if you just wanted to find one feasible point, so even if you just wanted to solve a linear system of AX equals to B, it would take, like the best algorithm we know right now is just to solve it, like just take the inverse of A, so we'll still take into the omega time. So basically this means, this is a strict lower bound for the algorithm. So this means for the current omega, uh, the algorithms for solving linear programs matches the algorithm for solving linear systems. But however, like 2.37 is not a very natural number. So in the community, it is believed that we should be able to achieve at some point that omega equals to 2 and alpha equals to 1, which would mean that uh, you could do matrix multiplication in the time that is their input size. So in this ideal case where omega would equals to 2 and alpha would equals to 1, solving linear system would only take uh, n squared time. But however, solving linear programs to so take into the 2 plus uh, 1 over 6 time. So the question would be, um, so can we show that solving general linear programs is as easy as solving linear systems? So would, in the algorithmic uh, point of view, can we show that there exist algorithms that have the same running time for LPs as for linear systems? So that is the main motivation of our project. So 
we moved one step forward towards showing this equivalence. So in our paper, we showed an algorithm that have um, into the 2 plus 1 over 18 running time instead of uh, 2 plus 1 over 6. So uh, we can view our result in two, two views. So the first is that this is an algorithm for the future. So in the future, if uh, the algorithms for fast matrix modification are improved, then our algorithm is a faster algorithm for solving linear programs. And the other point is that um, this is a interest, this conveys an interesting message. So it basically means that probably from a, like in an algorithmic point of view, solving linear programs is just as easy as solving linear systems. Okay, uh, and here I'm going to show you a picture about uh, all this history that I've talked about. Um, this blue line shows um, all the, the history of the algorithms for fast matrix multiplication, and they are the same running time as uh, algorithms for solving general linear systems. And one thing to notice is that here, so at some point, these algorithms were also stuck at this into the 2.5, but later it was improved. So it's similar to uh, the algorithm for LPs. And this red line, I'm going to show uh, the history of algorithms for linear programs. So we started with the simplex algorithm, which has exponential time. And then there was the first polynomial uh, ellipsoid method. And then came the faster interior point method. And it was stuck also, sorry, also at this 2.5 for several years. Until recently, it was improved to match uh, the running time of linear systems. And then in the ideal case where um, the linear systems would only take a square time, so this paper would take into the 2 plus 1 over 6 time. And this is where our result lies. So we show that in the ideal case where omega would reach to 2, uh, we could solve linear programs in into the 2 plus 1 over 18 time. So notice that currently the gap between uh, LP and um, linear systems is pretty small. So I think it would be interesting if you could further just reduce this gap. Shunhua, can I ask um, what, what happens at this Lee and Sitford 14, 15, these points here? Yeah, sure. So this paper is not for general dense LP. They are for the special LP which are tall. So, um, and they show that you can have a faster algorithm when for the special case where your uh, your matrix A is tall. So it will have the same running time as n to the point of life if we run this algorithm for dense general LP, but they are faster for other cases. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, next, let me give you a brief overview of our results. So I wanted to uh, explain where does this uh, magical exponent of 1 over 6 and 1 over 18 comes from. Okay, so uh, first thing I wanted to mention is that our algorithm as square root of n iterations, so this is um, consistent with almost all previous interior point methods. So almost all interior point methods for LP will have square root of n iterations. And this is also the same as the previous cohen lee on paper. So we don't actually improve the number of iterations, but we improve the, num the, the, the cost per iteration. Okay, uh, let me first explain what are the cost per iteration of this previous paper. So in the previous paper, um, they have this threshold parameter A. So you can think about A as uh, after accumulating A uh, number of updates, I would perform one update. And their update time is this, n to the omega minus half plus n to the 2 minus a over 2. And their query time is n to the 1 plus a. So they achieve their um, their final, this 1 over 6 exponent by balancing these two terms. So by balancing these two terms, if we let this exponent to equal to each other, you see that uh, the optimal choice is to set a to be two thirds. And this will give uh, into the 2 minus 1 over 3 cost per iteration. And then if we multiply this with the square root of n number of iterations, this will give you uh, n to the 2 plus 1 over 6 total running time. 
and in our running time. So we also have this first threshold parameter, but we also introduce a second uh, threshold parameter. The second threshold parameter needs to be smaller than alpha times a, where alpha is the du exponent um, of matrix multiplication. And we will have two levels of update. So our first level of update will have the same running time as the previous paper. And our second level of update have this n to the 1 plus a minus a to the over 2. So notice that this is even faster than the query. And we also have a faster query. OK. And now we will need to balance these three terms. And because we have two uh, parameters here, we will have more balancing power. So you can see that the optimal choice is to set a to be uh, a nice and set a to the to be two thirds. And this will give you n to the 2 to minus 4 over 9 cost per iteration. And then further multiply this with the square root of the number of iterations, we get our uh, into the 2 plus 1 over 18 final running time. Okay, uh, let, next let me give you a high level uh, idea about uh, what are our techniques. So as I already mentioned in the last slide, so in our update, we will use a two level update. So the previous paper used this one level lazy update framework where they have this threshold. Uh, and you can think about the intuition behind this lazy update as uh, the vectors are changing slowly, so it makes sense to update them lazily. And we use this intuition that, okay, so not only the vectors themselves are changing slowly, but the changes of their changes are kind of also changing slowly. So we could have another level of lazy update. Great. And we also achieve faster queries. So in the previous paper, they have some compression techniques on one side, and we generate this to have uh, compressions on both the left side and on the right side. Okay, that's a high level idea. So, okay, next, um, before I go into more details about these techniques, uh, let me first provide you a brief background about um, the central pass algorithm, which is a type of interior point method that we use, and how we can reduce this to a data structure maintenance problem. Okay, uh, so first, um, recall that this is the formulation of our primal algorithms, uh, sorry, primal LP, and this is the formulation of our DOLP. And if we use the KKT conditions, we can show that uh, the optimal solutions of these LPs must satisfy these constraints. So first, X and S must be non-negative, and then we have this constraint, this corresponds to primal feasibility, and the second constraint uh, corresponds to pro uh, dual feasibility. And we further have this third constraint. So this is called complementary selectness. And it says that the inner product of X and S need to be zero. So one thing to notice is that, uh, okay, the first thing is that by KKT conditions, if we have three vectors, X, S, and Y, that satisfy these conditions, then we know that they are the optimal solutions of our original LP. So now we only need to worry about um, these conditions. And notice that they are all almost linear. So the only nonlinear condition is the last one. And this is the kind of the only condition that is hard to satisfy. And this inner product of X and S have a natural uh, interpretation. So by very simple math, you can see that this inner product equals to the difference between the primal objective value and the dual objective value. So if it equals to zero, this means that your primal matches with your dual, so we reach uh, the optimal solution. But if it's small, it also means that we are close to optimality. So all these, the central pass algorithm basically uh, iteratively decrease the value of this duality gap. So, uh, we define this central pass, a point on the central pass with a parameter t. So this is called the central pass parameter. So basically, um, a, pa a point on the central pass is defined as a point that satisfies all the easy conditions. So they satisfy all these linear conditions. And it's the, the last condition is relaxed so that we don't need um, x times s to reach zero. We allow them to be some larger number t. And I wanted to mention that the dot here means coordinate wise multiplication. So basically, x dot s here means it's a vector where each coordinate is xi times si. Okay. Um, and in this algorithm, so initially, it's easy to obtain a point that is on the central pass for t equals to 1. And this algorithm would um, iteratively decrease the value of t 
and then reaches until it reaches zero, we reach the optimal point. So this red line is the central path that's defined here. And the algorithm actually works according to this orange line. So it doesn't actually exactly follow the central path, but it always stay in some neighborhood of the central path. So it's this zigzag path here. Okay. Okay, so this is the definition of a point on the central path and more details about this algorithm. So the algorithm actually decreased the value of t by one minus one over square root of n each iteration. So we cannot decrease it by too much because if you decrease it by too much, then after one step, you can you, are, you no longer stay in the neighborhood of the central path. And also this one over square root of n is the reason why there are square root of n iterations because after square root of n iterations, you will decrease t by a large constant factor. Okay, so in each iteration, the goal of the algorithm is to find the changes delta x and delta s to the vectors x and s so that the new point will still satisfy the above equations, but for some smaller t. And we see that we need to require delta x and delta s to satisfy these three equations. So the first equation corresponds to this primal feasibility condition. So it basically says that after adding delta x, this still needs to be satisfied. And similarly, the second condition uh, corresponds to this dual feasibility condition here. And the third condition, so the, on the left-hand side, this is basically the change to the inner product of x and s. And on the right-hand side, we require it to be decreased by one over square root of n factor. Okay. And now the thing to notice about these three equations is that, okay, so first, how many variables do we have? So we have delta x, where, which have size n, and delta s also have size n, and delta y have size d. So there are 2n plus d number of variables. And you see that, so this first is d, d equations, the second is n equations, and the third is also n equations. So there are exactly 2n plus d variables and 2n plus d equations, and all of these equations are linear. So we can solve this system of uh, linear equations in a closed form way. Oh, and another thing I wanted to mention is that um, so you can also derive these equations by just taking one Newton step in the system here. So in the last equation, we're ignoring second order terms, and that's exactly what the Newton step does. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to solve these equations in a closed form way. So uh, in the closed form solution, there will be this matrix P. So it's defined as follows. And here I wanted to uh, make sure you understand some notations. So in this line of research, people usually use the small uh, letter as a vector and use the capital vector as the diagonal matrix of that vector. So basically, capital X would mean a diagonal matrix where each of the diagonal entry uh, is made by the vector X. And here, when we write x divided by s, this means you divide the two uh, diagonal matrices coordinate wisely. So each coordinate of on the diagonal of this matrix is xi divided by si. And the square root here is also operation that's done in a coordinate wise way. Okay. And we define this vector h to be this vector here. And this is the closed form formula of this delta x and delta s. So basically, delta x is the identity matrix minus this matrix P times H, and delta S is this P times H. Okay, so this is a summary of what I've talked about. Um, this is a summary of the central pass algorithm. So there are square root of N iterations, and in each iteration we decrease T by one over square root of N, and then we will uh, compute this vector H, compute this matrix P, and compute delta X and delta S from these closed form formulas, and then we update X and S. Okay, so note that the naive implementation of this algorithm would take n to the omega plus a uh, half time. This is because there are square root of n iterations, and it's n to the omega time per iteration. And the main bottleneck of this algorithm is on line 5, because when we are going to compute this matrix P, there is an inverse here, sorry, and then computing the, the inverse would take n to the omega time. 
But another thing to note is that there is also a second barrier here. So the second barrier is on line six. So when we wanted to compute this matrix vector multiplication, naively it would take n squared time. Um, and I wanted to mention that as early as the Wadia paper that I mentioned in 1989, they already broke the first barrier. So they already have total running time of n to the 2.5, and that's n squared running time per iteration. But the second barrier, this n squared barrier, was only broke, uh, surpassed until the recent Cohen Lee Song paper. Okay, so now it's easy to see that in order to efficiently implement this central pass algorithm, it basically boils down to efficiently maintain this projection matrix P and to support queries of matrix vector multiplications. Okay, so let me talk to you about uh, more details about this projection matrix P. So the, here is an illustration of how this P looks like. And from now on, I will use this letter W to denote um, the, the division of X over S. Um, and we can, from now on, you can think about uh, your algorithm as in each duration, we're just given some vector W that is given by the central path. And we only need to worry about how to maintain this projection matrix. Okay. And P is called a projection matrix, which by definition, means that P times P equals to itself. And you can just plug in this formula and see that the inverse will uh, will cancel out. And all this projection matrix, they have a very good property, which basically says the L2 norm of the projection matrix times any vector um, is smaller than the L2 norm of the vector itself. This is because geometrically, a projection matrix projects a vector into some subspace. So it only decreased the length of the vector. And this property will be very important when we're trying to use the compression techniques for to achieve faster queries. Okay, so uh, the central pass algorithm basically boils down to this projection matrix maintenance data structure problem. So it basically means that in the ice iteration, we need to perform two operations to the data structure. The first operation is an update operation. So we are given some vector wi, and we need to update the projection matrix so that the vector inside it will be updated from wi minus one to uh, wi. And then we also have a query operator. So in the query operator, we're given some vector, and we need to output this uh, matrix vector multiplication. And the good thing about when designing this data structure is that we're not designing the data structure for the most general case where uh, this vector W and H are arbitrary. We're only designing this for the central pass algorithm. So we can exploit some properties of the central pass algorithm. And these will be very important. The first property we exploit is a stability guarantee. And this is pretty standard um, property of all interior point methods. So this stability guarantee basically says that um, w is changing very slowly across different iterations. So here, this division also means coordinate-wise division. So this is the vector that is the relative error between wi and wi minus one. And this guarantee says that uh, the L2 norm of this vector is always bounded by a constant. So how do we understand this thing? So it basically says, okay, so if now we are going to change every single coordinate of wi from wi minus one, then you can only change each coordinate by a one plus or minus one over square root of the n factor, because um, then this relative error vector would become one over square root of n on each coordinate, and that will give you an L2 norm of uh, constant. And on the other hand, if you're only going to change a few coordinates of this uh, vector w, you're allowed to change constant number of coordinates, and you can change them by a large constant factor. And then this autonomy is still bounded by a constant. So that is some property of the input sequence that we can exploit. Sorry. And there's a second property about the output. So this basically means that if you remember this orange zigzag path in the, in the previous slide, 
So it basically means in central pass algorithm, we do not need to output this exact matrix vector modification. So it's fine if we only output some vector that approximates this thing. So if, as long as you make sure that uh, each step of the central pass, you stay in the neighborhood of the central pass, then we can still show that this algorithm will converge correctly. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's basically it. And previously, when I said um, the update time or the query time of of these papers, I mean the update time and the query time of this data structure problem. Okay, so um, any questions so far? Okay, so next, uh, let me move into the more technical part. So I will first talk about how we get this uh, two-level lazy update. But before that, let me first tell you about this one-level lazy update of the previous paper. Um, okay, so recall that this is the definition of our projection matrix. And we will have t iterations, and in each iteration, we will have a new vector w. And we have this stability guarantee. So uh, first, okay, so in this slide, I'm going to tell you um, how they approximate this uh, projection matrix PW, and this approximation is also used in our paper. So as I, uh, as I explained the stability guarantee uh, in the previous slide, so it means that the difference between WI and WI minus one is nearly sparse which means that most of the coordinates will have a small difference. If you remember the two extreme cases that, that I talked about, so in the first extreme case, if you change all the coordinates, you can only change each of them by a very small factor. So they will have a very small difference. In the second extreme case, where you change constant number of coordinates by a constant factor, even though you change them by a lot, but you only change a few of them. So they're nearly sparse. And then we use another sequence of vectors v to approximate these vectors w. So how v is defined as follows. So in each iteration, we'll check uh, on, the, on each coordinate. So if the j's coordinate of w is different from the j's coordinate of v by a large factor, by some factor epsilon, then we'll, we'll update vj. Otherwise, we doesn't update that coordinate. So in this way, we make sure that the difference of vi and vi minus one is exactly sparse. Also, because we update all those coordinates that w is uh, far away from v, so this guarantees that v is a good approximation of w on each coordinate. And then this further means that the projection matrix P that, uh, that have v inside will be a good PSD approximation to the true projection matrix PW. And this will further imply that the vector we want to compute, uh, PW times H is a, sorry, PV times H is a good approximation of PW times H. So now the algorithm only uh, output PV times H. Okay. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that uh, so it's easy to compute these vectors v because a vector only has size n. So we will compute these vectors v in each iteration, but it will be hard to, to update this projection matrix in each iteration. So we actually do not um, update the projection matrix in iteration, but we do it in a lazy way. Okay, so that is the one level lazy update of the cohen lee on paper. Okay, so recall that this definition and we use this sequence of of V to approximate the sequence of W. And this is the output. So the data structure doesn't uh, update PVI iteration. Instead, it will maintain some projection matrix PV, where V will equals to some past VI. And they only update it in a lazy manner. So they only update it if uh, the difference between vi and v is large. So here, the zero norm means the number of coordinates that is not zero. So they will only update pv to pvi if uh, more than n to the a number of coordinates are different. And a is the threshold parameter that is smaller than alpha. Um, and otherwise, the update function doesn't do anything. So in the new iterations, our update function just doesn't do anything. And the query function will use this maintained PV 
and the difference between V A and V to compute this matrix vector multiplication on the fly. And the update, uh, the amortized update time is this. Uh, so note that this improves upon the naive time of into the omega. And there's one way to understand um, this amortized time is as follows. So it would take worst case n squared time to perform one update of PV. And that is because we will use fast rectangular matrix modification. And that is also the reason why uh, they need to require that uh, the threshold parameter is smaller than alpha because they need to use fast matrix, fast rectangular matrix modification here. So it takes n squared time to perform one update. And then intuitively, this PV is updated in every square root of n to the a iterations. And that's why here we will get n to the 2 minus a over 2, because this is uh, the, the cost per update divided by the frequency that you perform the update. OK. Um, and next, here I will show an illustration of this one level lazy update. So uh, in the illustration, I will use a dog to represent the sequence of W. So it is, it is a stochastic sequence. And I will use a circle to represent this V that we maintain in the data structure. And V is only lazily updated to some location that is near uh, a new W when the difference is large. Okay. So initially, uh, V is the same as W, so, so the circle will sit in the same location as the dog. And as the dog moves, so as long as it's still within a small distance from the maintained vector V, we do not do anything. But if it moves further away, then we will update V to some location that is very close to the true value. And similar here. Okay. Um, and this orange pass would represent the, your naive update time. And this is, you can see that this pass is long because it's into the omega time naively. And the blue pass would represent um, the, the time for the lazy update framework. And then you can see that um, the blue pass is shorter than the orange pass. Okay. Okay, so next let me talk about um, our two level lazy update. So similar to the previous paper, we will also use the sequence of V uh, that approximates the sequence of W. And our output will also be uh, PV times HI instead of PW times HI. And we will also maintain uh, this vector V. And we'll call this a first level member. And we maintain this uh, projection matrix PV. And V is lately updated. But we will also introduce a second level uh, vector, which we will call V tilde. And V2 that will also equal to some past VI prime, but it, it will equal to some VI prime that is more recent than V. So the second level update will be performed more frequently than the first level update. And the data structure will further maintain a second level member, uh, which we call B V2 them. And it has a smaller size that has size uh, into the A times into the A. And I will get, talk more about the definition of this B V2 them in the next slide. But now you can think about B V2 them as the difference between PV tilde and PV. Uh, and our update function also works in a lazily manner. So it will only uh, update BV tilde to some BVI in the ice iteration if the difference between VI and V tilde is larger than n to the A tilde, where A tilde is now a second threshold parameter and it is smaller than the first threshold parameter by uh, alpha factor. So we use the alpha factor here is because, again, we need to use fast rectangular matrix multiplication, but now for smaller uh, matrices. And otherwise, our, matrix, our update function doesn't do anything. And when we query, the query function will use the first member, PV and BV tilde, because you can think about BV tilde as PV tilde minus PV, and then the difference between VI and V tilde to compute uh, this solution on the fly. OK, um, so next, let me talk about more about uh, what is this BV tilde. So we will use Woodbury identity to compute the difference between uh, PV tilde and PV. So what is Woodbury identity? Woodbury identity is basically um, a closed form formula for computing the inverse of uh, some addition of matrices. OK, so if you use Woodbury identity, so this is the definition of PV tilde and this is PV. 
and their difference can be written in the in the such uh, decomposition of three matrices. So basically, here we will have a tall matrix, and in the middle we will have a small matrix, and the right will we'll have another um, long matrix. And our BV tilde is defined exactly as this small inverse matrix in, matrix in the middle, and then we can use BV tilde to compute this difference between PV tilde and PV. Okay, so next let me talk about uh, what are the worst case running times of our second level lazy update. So the time to update PV is the same as before. It would take n square time. And the time to update uh, BV to them to perform a second level update, it takes time n to the one plus a. So notice that this is the same as the previous query time because previously in each query time, you need, they need to compute this difference. But now we kind of delay this computation to the second level uh, update. Okay, so now is a summary about the amortized time of our two level lazy update. So uh, the first level update is performed less frequent than the second level update. And intuitively, the first level update is performed in every square root of n to the a iterations. And the second level update is performed in every square root of n to the a to the iterations. Um, and then that will give the amortized time. So the worst case time to perform a first level uh, Lazy, sorry, a first level update is n squared, so you divide this by a over two, and this gives the second level amortized time. So the worst case, so the cost per per update is n to the one plus a, and then we need to divide it by a square root of n to the a to the. And now, since we have these two parameters, we can now choose the threshold a to be larger because we will have more power to balance between these two uh, parameters. Okay, so that's enough for the details. Let me also give you an illustration. So similar as before, this dog will represent the path of the true sequence W. And we will use V, this blue V to denote the first level uh, vector, and this purple V to, the, to denote the second level vector. Okay, and in the beginning, uh, our V and V to the will both sit in the same location as the true vector W. And as the dog moves, so as long as the CV was in a small distance from the second um, member, we do not do anything. But if it moves away, then we will update um, the sec we'll perform a second level update. So we will move the location of this um, V2 to some some approximate vector. Okay, and if the dog moves even further away, then we will perform this more expensive first level update. So we will move this uh, V here. Okay. Uh, and the orange part here, again, will represent um, the naive update time, and that will be um, into the omega. And the purple line here uh, would represent the second level update. So we can think about um, the length of the purple, purple path as the number of times that you need to perform the update. And, and the blue path would correspond to the first level uh, update. So now, why we can achieve faster running time than previously? Because now this purple path will probably will be, so we'll probably perform the second level update the same number of times as before, but each cost, so it, so it will be cheaper. So perform a second level update is cheaper than the first level update. So this purple, the cost of this purple pass will be smaller than before. And now because we have this purple pass to help us, we can have a shorter blue pass. So um, the total cost of the first level update will also be smaller. Okay, so that's an intuition for the second level update. Okay. Okay, um, next I'm going to talk about um, how we achieve faster queries. Uh, before that, let me first provide an overview about some compression techniques in the previous several previous papers. Uh, first, recall that our query will update um, this, sorry, our query will output this matrix vector multiplication where this V is the approximate, an approximate vector to the true vector W. And note that if we compute this naively, it would take n squared time to do a matrix vector multiplication. 
So previous papers use this uh, compression techniques. So intuitively, they will compress this matrix P from size n by n to size b by n, so that you multiply it with a vector would now only take n times b time. And we, you can think about um, b to be square root of n uh, in this talk. Okay, so first there are some randomized compression techniques. Um, the first randomized compression technique is called sketching, where we will use a sketching matrix R of size b times n. And uh, the most common sketching matrix is just a random Gaussian matrix, so where each coordinate of the matrix R is sampled from some random Gaussian distribution. And another uh, randomized compression technique is called sampling. So basically, we will sample b number of rows from the total of n number of rows. So we will use this diagonal sampling matrix D. So this diagonal matrix will have size n times n, but it only has b non-zero entries. Uh, and one thing I wanted to mention about this comp uh, randomized compression technique is that their error usually have a form that looks like this. So right now I'm only showing this error for, for sketching, but it's almost the same for sampling. So if we add sketching in the middle of, um, in between of this matrix and this vector H, then the total error will have two terms. The first term is the L to norm on the left, so it's the L to norm of this vector, and the second term is the L to norm on the right. So that is the, that is the place where we need to use the good property of projection matrix, because projection matrix times a vector will only have a smaller L to norm. So that means, um, on the right or on the left of the projection matrix is the correct position to put these randomized compression techniques. If you put it in other places, uh, these autonomes might blow up. Okay, and there is also uh, another deterministic compression technique. And this is called vector maintenance. So this technique basically maintains some vector G that approximates um, this true vector H. So it's kind of similar as the previous lazy update techniques where we use this vector V to approximate the vector W. Now they use another vector to approximate um, this query vector. Okay, and here's the summary of all these compression techniques. Uh, so in the original, in the first Cohen Lee sum paper, they used the sampling technique and they put sampling on the right of the projection matrix. So now you can see that because this sampling matrix only have B non zero entries, so now perform this P times DH will only take N times B time. And then there were two later papers that use sketching, and one of them put sketching on the left of the projection matrix and one on the right of the projection matrix. And then in the update operations, so instead of actually maintaining P, they will actually maintain R times P. So this is a matrix of size B times N. And then in the query, you only need to multiply the smaller matrix with the vector, and it will only take uh, B times N time. And finally, there was this uh, fourth paper that proposed this deterministic technique. So they use this vector maintenance um, so that in each iteration, they only need to compute, they can maintain P times G, and they only need to compute P times some sparse uh, uh, vector of the changes, sorry, of the difference between G and H. Okay. And what does our query do? So we basically just combine the sketching on the left technique and the vector maintenance on the right technique. And in this way, we can get uh, compression on both sides. So previously, so okay, so the naive running time is n squared. In previous paper, they only have compression on one side, and that will give them uh, m to the one plus a query time. So basically, you are compressing one one in the exponent. And now, because we have compression on both sides, so we are we can further compress this other one on the exponent. So we will achieve uh, n to the a plus a to the running time. And uh, that's how we get our final um, data structure. So we show that there is a data structure that uses n squared space, uh, and it maintain a projection matrix P while supporting these two operations. So it supports, uh, updates the W inside the projection matrix in this running time, and it supports a uh, query of the matrix vector modification in this running time. And if we add these two running times together, this is the cost per iteration of our uh, final central pass algorithm. Okay, uh, so some final remarks. Uh, the first is that 
after our paper, there was a recent follow-up uh, in, in SOSA this year, and it shows a simplified unifying framework to make dynamically maintain matrix inverse for these iterative algorithms, and it simplifies our paper. And some possible future questions. The first is, of course, uh, can we show how to solve LP in n squared time when omega equals to 2? And the second would be, uh, can we use these type of lazy techniques and these type of uh, dynamic data structures for optimization techniques to other optimization problems? Okay, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Shina. So everybody, let's thank the, the speaker and then have questions if there are any. So uh, um, maybe I'll ask Shinhua. So the um, the sketching on the left is the sketching matrix chosen once, or or does it keep changing? How how does this work? Oh, uh, um, so we actually need to use a larger. So you need to use a sketching matrix in each iteration. And because there are square root of n iterations, so you actually in the beginning you will have, uh, you will stack all these sketching matrices. So you have a n by n matrix, and you will perform uh, in the beginning. And then in each query, you will only take one of them out to compute your query. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um... There's a question in, in the chat from Yiting Hua. Do we have a lower bound for solving LPs? Is the lower bound n squared? Yeah, n squared is a natural lower bound because it's the same as the input size. So we consider general dense LP. So the input size of A is already n squared. But I guess just to clarify, there's nothing that stops us from, no known lower bound that stops us from having uh, like number of non-zeros is the running time. In yeah, 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 yeah. Um, So maybe I'll ask, uh, do, do you think uh, kind of, is it, is it clear what's the question to solve to go further? So to, to further, yeah. So like one very natural idea is to further generalize from two levels to more levels. Mm -hmm. And if we like have some ideal numbers you plug in, you could see that you could reach an squared running time if you have more level. But right now, so we tried this, but right now the problem is that we don't know how to go beyond levels. So one intuition is that for two levels, we can have com those compression techniques on the left side and on the right side. And that kind of matches with those two level of lazy updates. Like if you see the, the query time here, it has A plus A cuda, so it's kind of matching with the update. But if you wanted to go more than two levels, you need to add more compression. So you kind of need to add compression in the mid production matrix. And then in our previous calculations, the error would blow up. So currently we still don't know how to do that. So it might be possible, but it will require new techniques to further uh, sketch the projection matrix in the middle. Okay, yes, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if that's uh, all the questions we have, then uh, let's thank the speaker again. Oh, we had perhaps one person with one more question left. If, so I saw a raised hand. If, if people want to, uh, we can even put you on stage if you want to ask a question, but uh, maybe this was just an accident. Okay, I guess uh, it's coming in the by accident. Yeah, okay, all right. 
Uh, thank you so much, Shunhua. That was very interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be exciting to see uh, when do people get all the way to N squared. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I just want to say to everybody, as usual, we have this uh, this uh, opportunity to go talk to each other on these uh, video tables afterwards. So.